webinar, um, but we're not going to record the the Q and A, just the um, just the presentations. So, um, yeah, and then I'll, I'm quickly going to introduce uh, each of the speakers, and then uh, we'll we'll hear hear from them. So, I'll, I'm going to introduce them in, in reverse order of, of the the order that they're presenting. Um, so first of all, uh, we have uh, Catherine Gomez, who is an associate professor um, in RMIT's School of Media and Communication um, in, in Melbourne. And her recent edited books include Digital Experiences of International Students, Challenging Assumptions and Rethinking Engagement uh, with Shantan Chang and Religion, Hypermobility and Digital Media in Global Asia, Faith, Flows and Fellowship with Lily Kong on Orlando Woods. So today she's going to be presenting a discussion of some of the key points in her most recent sole authored book, uh, Parallel Societies of International Students in Australia, uh, Connections, Disconnections uh, and a Global Pandemic, um, which, yeah, I think is probably going to be essential reading for anybody researching international students uh, kind of in the next in the next few years. Um, then uh, we have Dr. Cora Lingling Xu, uh, who is an assistant professor in education at Durham University. And her research interests include educational mobilities, identities and social theories. Um, and she uh, looks at uh, cross-border student uh, mobility and academic migration, uh, ethnic minorities and uh, rural education uh, in contemporary Chinese society. Um, and I thought I should also note, she's also very active uh, in terms of uh, kind of non-academic things, uh, especially online. Um, so uh, she's the founder and director of the network uh, for research into Chinese educational mobilities. And she also awesome. runs uh, a YouTube channel, um, which I think is kind of like a, uh, a lot of students see that as a, a source of support because um, there's not actually a lot of other things like that out there. Um, and then we have uh, Professor Lee Tran, who's going to be presenting first. Um, so a professor in the School of Education at, at Deakin University and an Australian Research Council Future Fellow. Her research um, focuses on international education, inbound and outbound student mobilities, international graduate employability and Vietnamese higher education. And uh, yeah, published like a huge volume of work on, on all of those topics over the past few years. And again, a lot of her work really essential reading um, or listening uh, for those of us doing research in international education. And uh, her presentation today is going to be focused on uh, study to work transitions of international students in Australia. So for the format, um, we're going to have the Q&A after the three presentations. So each of the three presentations uh, will be about 20 minutes long. Um, and then if you want to just write your questions in the chat, then we can just go through them one by one. And I'll ask you to turn your, at least turn your microphone on and, and read the question. Um, or you can just uh, like raise your hands using the, the function um, on here. So yeah, so um, without further ado, um, uh, Lee, would you like to uh, start your presentation? Yeah. Hello, Ben. Good evening, everyone from Melbourne, Australia, and welcome to our webinar. Um, yeah, thank you, Ben, for the opportunity for me to share what, what I have learned in the space of um, international student and the nexus between post study work rights, employment, and international education. Um, I have to apologize in advance that I'm not completely well today. So if there is anything in my presentation that I couldn't explain clearly, feel free to put a question in the chat box and, and um, I'm happy to answer after the webinar or via email. <laughs> I'm sure that Ben will communicate. Um, yeah, so let me start by sharing my screen. Me so can you share, uh, can you see my screen? Not yet. Not yet, not yet. Okay. Um, yeah. 
just now we practice and yeah it was <laughs> fine <see> that. <laughs> yeah um i start again i think it should be here okay there we go there we go okay excellent um so there are three key points that i would like to cover in my presentation uh, first, I will talk about the role of post-study work rights policy, international student decision making, and um, how that policy influenced international student decision in um, choosing study destination. And then I move on to discuss further post-study work, employment outcomes, and migration opportunities. And I'll wrap up with um, raising the concern about chicken or S problem in relation to post study work rights and migration, as well as in relation between um, to the, the nexus between post study works um, and, and employment experience. And, in, and um, yeah, I'll wrap up with implication for international education. So, yeah, where um, the traditional pull and push factors shaping international student mobility trends um, include the ranking of university and the reputation of study destination, um, the issues of cost, uh, including tuition fee and living cost, and um, safety and employment and migration opportunities. But with COVID-19, um, so it likely that this student mobility trend um, have been affected by COVID-19 infection loss and um, the recovery in both sending and receiving country vaccination uptake and effectiveness, and the length of border closures, and one of the key factors that we often discuss as well as in um, the media is the different host country approaches to supporting international students and dealing with um, COVID-19 racism. Um, another critical issue um, in the debate is geopolitical tension, especially how geopolitical turbulence have been as, as, um, increased during COVID-19 between China and Australia and uh, between China and the US. And um, another factor is the quality and flexibility of both online and blended learning um, in onshore and offshore delivery. Um, the issue of visa extension, renewal support, um, and flexibility. Um, and the focus of my presentation today, as my, I mentioned, it could be one of the key factors affecting um, international student mobility trends is policy around post-study work, skill needs, impacted by COVID-19 and the supply and demand of the labor market in both home and host country and migration opportunity. Um, and we also mentioned the growth of educational hubs in Asia and the emer emergence of non-traditional student destination. Um, and interestingly, we have observed over the past year, um, different creative and alternative transnational education models, including um, a couple of governments, permit um, for Australian and foreign university to offer fully online degree in the home country, uh, in international student home country, and the trend of internationalization at home. So as we witnessed prior to COVID-19, international education geared toward internationalization abroad, but COVID-19 and travel constraint has made international education geared more toward internationalization at home. Um, so in the context of Australia, post-study work is a draw cast for university to attract international students. And um, it's the same for Canada, New Zealand, uh, US and the UK. And in one of our publications, we were able to compare those five countries. Um, so at, at June 2020, there was around 90,000 post-study work visa holders. Um, in Australia, it is referred to 485 visa holders. And um, that population accounts for almost 
0 0.7 of the Australian workforce. Um, on average, 76% of international student, international graduates in our survey see that the opportunity to get access to post-study work visa is an important factor in their decision to um, study in Australia. But Indian students tend to be the most sensitive group with 82% of them think that it is an um, important factor. And um, we compare um, in the third quarter of 2019, uh, the UK and Australia was equally searched at a study destination from India. Um, so at 16.2% and 16.8% um, respectively. But um, with the reintroduction of the post-study work rise in the UK in September 2019, the search results increased by 47% um, to the UK and decreased by 15% to Australia. Um, with regard to our study, in addition to asking international graduates to compare um, uh, uh, across different destinations and also the um, how the role of post-study work visa in their decision making. We also compare the uh, data from uh, the Department of Home Affairs and um, the top five countries of temporary credit visa holders, so for A5 visa holders, mirror exactly the top five source country of international student commencement um, in the master by coursework. So there, there's a perfect match, uh, match uh, across the top five in, in these. So a little bit about our study, it was conducted between 2016 and 2019. And um, we have done critical analysis of policy and secondary data set. So policy, we mainly focused on international education and post-study work rights policy across Australia, the UK, US, Canada, and New Zealand. And we also use the data set by um, the Bureau of Statistics in Australia, as well as um, the Department of Home Affairs. And we conducted um, 50 interviews over three years. After 2019, we conducted 30 interviews more um, in, in Vietnam with both um, international creditors, returnees, and uh, employers. And the third component of the study is the survey with um, 1,150 international students who graduated, graduated from Australian University from 35 Australian universities. So um, one of the key findings is how international student who was on the post-study work visa rank the usefulness of the post-study work visa. Um, so there are two groups um, on the 485 visa. So for those who still remain in Australia and for those who visa expire, who post-study visa expire and they return to their home countries. So for those who remain in Australia, pathway to permanent resident is um, the most important use, um, is ranked at the most useful factor of their post-study work visa and that followed by enhanced my employability, enhanced my professional network, um, enhanced my social network and um, the chan, sorry. And, um, the chan to secure a job in my field of study. Um, and on the contrary, um, for those who return to their home countries, um, post-study work visa is seen to be um, the least useful in providing them with a pathway to permanent resident. And I will explain why a bit later on. So now let's have a quick look at the current employment status for um, those who are, and who used to be in, um, who are and who used to hold post-study work visa but remain in Australia. So I mentioned earlier that two group, one group still remain in Australia and the other who have left Australia to come back to their home country and another proportion to work in a third countries. Um, so on average, 
36% of both past and present post-study work visa holders could find job in their field of study. But for the past holder of 4A5 visa, um, up to 50%, 52% of them could find work in their field of study compared to 28 um, who were current holder of um, the post-study work visa. And one of the key factors is that for past holder of um, for A5 visa, when their visa expire, um, a large proportion of them were able to secure permanent residency and um, that give them a license and a competitive advantage in the Australian labor market. And that's why the percentage of those past holder of for A5 visa could secure job in their field of study is much higher than um, current holder of for A5 visa. And another thing is that um, they have more time to accumulate experience and change job and secure job in their field of study. Now let's have a look at the time lapse between graduation and um, employment in Australia. So as you can see for those who graduated in 2015, um, 52% of them could find job in their field of study and that followed by 49% of them in 2016. And the um, least successful group could be for those who graduated in 2019, so 18%. Um, and that's quite understandable and, and aligns with the Australian in, uh, graduate employment survey um, because it may take graduates up to six months in order to find full-time or part-time job in their field of study. So 2019 was the time that we surveyed the students. Um, yeah, so here, sorry, I mean, but, so where do international graduates work? Um, this figure show that uh, for both male and female, um, the, the biggest proportion works in small or medium sized business that are not owned by someone from their home country, and that is followed by um, 26% for male graduates and 20% for female graduates who work uh, in branch of an international company. And um, when we look at private, public and non-profit sector, clearly the majority of them work in um, the private sector and that um, followed by public or government sector. And one of the key reason is that um, it's extremely difficult in Australia for international graduates on temporary work visa to get a job in government um, sector because um, in those sector, um, migration or citizenship um, is one of the key, key criteria in job application. So clearly um, the discrimination toward those who are on temporary visa is more in the um, at the entry level appear to be more intensive in the government sector. And for those who work um, in the public or government sector here, the majority of them in the survey work in the university sector. So university are more tolerant um, to what international graduates compared to other public sector. Um, and some university staff, when we interview, they see that employing their own international graduates is a win-win policy because um, they are able to retain very capable candidates. And at the same time, they can have their own international um, graduates. Um, let's have a quick look at the median annual income. So we can see that for um, the group that have the, the lowest income, here is the current temporary graduate visa holder um, and past visa holders um, can enjoy much higher salary compared to current one, um, mainly because they have more experience and also many of them have migration. So they have more advantage um, and bargaining power in the labor market, but um, they still lag behind in terms of income compared to Australian graduates with 
postgraduate coursework and um, undergraduate degree. Um, yeah, we had the start international graduates on temporary graduate visa see it impacting their employment status. So you can see that for the negative impact, their visa status is um, the factor that is considered to have the most negative impact on their employment. Okay, so um, based on the data from the survey and interview, um, we are able to simplify some of the key constraints. Um, the key challenge in the Australian concept, context is that um, employers often have no idea about what post-study work visa or for A5 visa is. And um, some of them may understand the purpose of temporary credit visa, um, but they prefer to recruit, recruit candidates with permanent residency, PR or citizenship. And also they have misconception about um, what the visa is as well as um, international student capabilities. And many um, organization in Australia use visa labor to filter their candidates. For instance, um, um, the terms like restricted work visa or unrestricted work visa often used and um, job as with the, the label like PR or citizenship only or full-time permanent or full-time ongoing. So if you um, see the words full-time permanent or full-time ongoing international credits on temporary visa can apply, even though they have um, non-restricted work rights, but their, the duration of their visa is, um, for instance, between two to five years. So they can apply for full-time ongoing. And um, a lot of employers are concerned about the security of um, the temporary nature of the visa. So the term temporary in the visa often trigger the concern of employers. And the visa also have the barriers itself, including the lack of flexibility for renewal or extension and lack of continuing support from institution and key stakeholders. And another key, challenge in the Australian context is the illusion that the temporary credit visa is an easy pathway to permanent residency. Um, ben, can I just ask how I'm going with time? I can get wrapped up. Uh, yeah, you're, you're totally fine. Yeah, uh, just like another four or five minutes is, is fine. Okay, yeah, thank you. And, um, one of the key findings in, in our study, um, especially from the interviews with international creditors, but also with employers and um, government officers, is the chicken or egg problem around employment and migration. So um, as I explained before, the majority of employers prefer candidates with permanent residency or citizenship. And um, they, some of them say, why buying the burden of recruiting someone with a temporary visa status and set them up and train them and, um, you know, investing time and, and um, resources in training them and they are about to leave the country due to the, the duration of their visa. And um, they use the metaphor of buy, why buying the burden. But I think the key thing here is uh, demand and supply. So um, there is a big supply of both domestic and international credits in the labor markets while the demand um, in some areas especially in um, specialized areas um, is quite low. So international um, employers have a lot of choices. Um, yeah, so basically international creditors are disadvantaged because they don't hold permanent residency or citizenship. And, but at, at the same time, if they can't secure job, especially in their field of study, they can't secure the five points 
which is really critical in their application for permanent residency. So um, without employment, it had to have my migration or um, permanent residency. But without permanent residency, it's really hard to get food in the labor market, especially in your field of study. Um, so, and there is another um, research circle is between local work experience and employment. So in order to get food in the door, um, a lot of international graduates will need some local work experience, but without the opportunity to have employment or to be employed, it has, they, they can't get local work experience. Um, so um, that circle is really um, a big area in, in hindering international students in um, entering the labor market in Australia. And um, even though international students, when they apply for study in Australia and other countries, offshore, um, especially through Asian offshore, it was given the, the illusion that it is an easy pathway uh, from temporary graduate visa to permanent residency, but actually it is a possible, but it's it not easy as all, well, especially in the current context, when the POI is required to secure permanent residency, keep raising. And um, we can see that there has been a transformation from the education migration nexus. So the direct link between international and education nexus to education, work and migration nexus here. Um, a lot of people mentioned that the education and migration nexus in Australia has been decrupt, um, but it's still there. It's just that another key factor that come in between it is work or employment. So education, work and migration nexus. My final slide. Um, one of the key statistics that I would like to share with you is of the uh, nearly 31,000 post-study work visa holders who transitioned to other visas in 2018 and 2019 in Australia, um, around 45.3% of them became skilled migrants. And um, nearly 35% of them became international students again. So um, as I mentioned earlier, um, after two years for uh, master graduates um, on the post-study work visa, their visa expired. So they either have um, transitioned into mig migration or come back to their home country or go to another country or become international student again. Some transition into a tourism visa, but a significant proportion of them became international student again. Um, overall in the survey though, despite challenges, a lot of them could use the time on their post-study work visa to earn a return of their investment in study in Australia. And many are able to pay back their loan, uh, their study loan. So overall, uh, um, around 66% are certified, um, certified with their experience on the post-study work visa. So we can see that international creditors who stay in Australia are young, highly qualified and global competent workforce. They are educated in Australian university and they have multilingual capabilities. They possess transnational knowledge and skill. Um, many of them have um, international work experience um, from their home country or another country become, before becoming an international student in Australia. But um, for those who are quite young, they still have international social and cultural experience. Um, they uh, play a key role in transnational or lifetime in country networks. Um, but the key question is, has Australia really tapped on this pool of talent to deliver the benefits to its economy and key stakeholders? Um, and our research also showed that um, a lot of employers are hesitant in recruiting temporary visa holder. But for those who have prior experience in recruiting this cohort, they are willing to do so again. Um, so I would like to wrap up. Thank you to my participants and um, to all of you. 
Okay, thanks so much. Yeah, uh, that's really interesting. Um, and yeah, that, that was really enlightening for me as well. Um, so yeah, fantastic. Um, so yeah, we're gonna have the, the Q&A at the end. So the um, next up, we have Cora. So similar kind of a topic, but we're, we're going over to the UK. So, so thanks, Cora. Thank you, Ben, and thank you, Lee. Uh, such a fascinating presentation. And I think my paper speaks very well uh, to, to Lee's uh, findings. Um, can you see my screen share? Yes, okay, thanks, Ben, and thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Cora Shi. I'm an assistant professor at Durham University. And today, my paper is going to be about career imagination, transnational distinction, and family mediated migration infrastructure. Specifically, I'm talking about Chinese international students to the UK. So I'm going to take you away from Australia for, for a moment, right? Um, so my paper today is led uh, primarily by uh, this question, uh, and it asks, what does it take to be educationally mobile? You know, in the context of transnational student mobility, for instance, between China and the UK, and in the context of a global pandemic, such as the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Also, against the background of Western degree inflation in the, in the Chinese domestic uh, labor market. So in order to address these uh, a, a set of questions, I'm going to draw upon three different data sets uh, based on uh, three uh, research studies that I have conducted either on my own or with my colleagues. Uh, the first data set, uh, uh, which I have recently published in Time and Society, was about the study to work transition of Chinese international students in the UK. And, and this, you will, you will soon find, uh, it's actually very much related to what uh, Lee has, has just uh, spoken about. So I'm really glad that Ben has arranged the papers in this order. Um, so this study uh, was conducted before the pan pandemic between uh, 2018 and 2019. And we spoke uh, with uh, 21 uh, Chinese international students from different institutions. And we conducted both face-to-face -face interviews and online interviews with them. The second data set uh, was uh, conducted, uh, was a study conducted by, by my co-author Si Qijang and myself. And uh, the, the study was carried out in 2015 and 2016. And we uh, interviewed and observed 25 female Chinese students at one UK university. Um, the, the third data set, uh, sorry, and, and for this study, we mainly looked at how these uh, female Chinese students constructed what we call transnational distinction. And in the third, uh, a study that I'm drawing upon, we conducted this study um, in the middle of the pandemic. So it was between April and May 2020, following the first national lockdown in the UK. And in this study, not only did we spoke uh, speak with uh, Chinese international students themselves, but we also spoke with their, some of their parents. Um, all of our interviews were conducted online, again, because of the pandemic. And our findings were published in uh, Chinese, uh, the Chinese Sociological Review. Uh, and for the second paper, we, uh, we published our findings in the British Journal of Sociology of Education last year. Now I'd like to begin uh, with the first uh, data set. And in this data set, uh, we, like I mentioned earlier, uh, we focused on the study to work transition of Chinese international students. And this was uh, uh, based on a critique of the existing literature uh, that is, uh, you know, which I, I argue that you know, students, uh, international students, uh, very often are statisticized as lifeless figures, you know, that constitute graduate employment indicators. Um, uh, very often they are also assumed to be individuals, you know, uh, individualized in a sense, because they are frequently assumed to be individual free agents able to respond to a, a suite of challenges such as migration policies, as you can uh, see very evidently from uh, Lee's uh, presentation earlier on. Um, and, and it's as if they can freely just navigate their individual career or lifestyle preferences uh, without really uh, paying attention to the fact that they may be embedded in webs of uh, family relations, intimate relations. They may have caring responsibilities, commitments to their intimate uh, partners, Etc. Etc. Also, uh, very often international students tend to be homogenized. You know, they are typically portrayed to fit this persona of being from, uh, you know, financially secure, having the support and emo 
like including emotional and material support of family and friends, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and because of, the, of this critique, I argue that uh, a lot of the uh, research has focused prevalently on the present, the now of these international students' employability, whereas there is much oblivion of the unpredictable future. And the, as we have uh, witnessed, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, sort of um, uh, as it gradually unfolded, there is a lot of unpredictability. And therefore, it's important for us to assess and to bear in mind, uh, uh, taking into consideration the impact of the passage of time on these students' post-study career enactment and indeed career imagination. Therefore, it's important for us to pay attention to the heterogeneous nature uh, of the makeup of international students and pay attention to the differentiated nature of their career development needs. And more importantly, uh, I argue for a need to pay attention to how time features in and shapes the career imagination of international students. And based on this critique, um, in my Climate Society paper, I identify two uh, temporal career strategies um, uh, as employed by the students that I interviewed. And, and uh, the first career strategy uh, was about what I call deferred gratification. And the second one is uh, temporal de destructuring. Uh, in my paper today, however, I'm only going to focus on the deferred gratification strategy. Um, very, very often, uh, we find that these students, uh, uh, they go through a waiting period in order to engage in work that they truly feel passionate about. For instance, here I'm evoking the cases of Man and Lee, both of which are pseudonyms, as, I can, as you can imagine. Um, so both of them um, uh, apply for a graduate entrepreneur visa in the UK. For, for colleagues who are familiar with the context of the UK, uh, it's incredibly hard to get a tier two skilled worker visa because in order to get a visa, you need to already have got an offer from a recognized sponsor uh, before you apply for that visa. Uh, an alternative route was therefore the graduate entrepreneur visa. And for the students to get this visa, they needed to have quite a lot of investment from themselves or from their family. Now, in this case, both Men and Lee drew upon abundant resources from their family. As you can see from the uh, quote highlighted in uh, yellow, um, so in order to apply for the visa, Men needed to have 10,000 pounds in her personal, personal bank account uh, to prove that she was financially viable, okay? But uh, that was just the beginning of the story. Uh, what was very important for her to, to, uh, to do her destination wedding planning business in London was because her parents already bought her a house in central London. And that way she did not have to worry about making substantial, uh, generating substantial profits uh, based on her own business. Did not, she did not have to pay rent. So there was one less thing for, for her to worry about. And a, a similar case uh, happened to Lee, who, uh, whose true passion was really in luxury retail sales business. But in order to uh, get this graduate entrepreneur visa, he uh, set up a milk tea business in central London. And again, his parents supported all of these endeavors, and plus, again, buying a house in central London, or I don't know, maybe not central London, in this case, zone two or zone three London, which is still very, very pricey. So in both cases, they were extremely grateful to, to their parents' investment. But here what I'm trying to highlight is uh, that here we are speaking about some really privileged uh, uh, students, you know, whose families have got quite a, a substantial amount of financial capital to invest on them. Uh, and this compare or contrast with Lee's paper, uh, you know, in, in relation to the students who are uh, you know, drawing upon the temporary visa in Australia and having to work on temporary uh, jobs, etc., trying to make up uh, or trying to um, re repay the, the, the sort of loans that they borrow. So we're talking about uh, students who are enjoying quite a lot of middle class privilege here in this case. The second data set that I'm drawing on uh, was the, the study that we, uh, in which we, we explore how Chinese women international students in the UK constructed their transnational distinction. And this was against the background of uh, China's one child policy, which was in force for a few decades. Um, and that uh, sort of resulted in uh, Chinese families, especially urban middle class families, investing a great deal of resources in their only daughter. 
and uh, and therefore a lot of uh, you know Chinese one child uh, uh, middle class young women from one child families were able to pursue transnational education. However, um, uh, the reality was that despite their you know, high academic achievements and degrees, qualifications from overseas universities, there, there still persist uh, you know, these uh, harsh gender expectations in the labor market in, in China. And plus what I earlier mentioned, the Western uh, degree inflation phenomenon in China. And therefore, uh, this sort of background sort of challenged the assumed distinction in transnational student mobility, meaning that having uh, uh, access or having possession of a transnational degree doesn't necessarily constitute distinction in the labor market or in the, in the marriage market, etc. And therefore, in this paper, we uh, focus a lot on the less visible embodied cultural capital that these Chinese women students drew upon to, to showcase and to construct that is, uh, transnational distinction, to distinguish themselves away from, from other graduates. You know. And uh, a very important uh, aspect of this transnational distinction was what we call embodied global cultural taste. And many of these students, uh, they increase their embodied global cultural taste through frequenting exhibitions, museums, galleries, uh, operas, uh, musicals, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in their spare time when they were studying in the UK. Uh, apparently, this was uh, before the pandemic, uh, which was uh, which made things much easier. Um, and here, especially, I'm drawing upon the uh, account of Fei Fei. Uh, so Fei Fei said, you know, I felt proud to share with curious friends at home, meaning back in China, about my increasing knowledge of, of uh, British or Western societies. And, and this to her was a very important way of distinguishing herself, you know, translating, uh, uh, is distinguishing her, herself from, from, from the, the, the crowd, basically. However, in this quote, she also shows uh, her very interesting understanding of the uh, uh, class fabrics of the British society. She said, it is strange that when facing the local people, such feelings disappear, maybe because they are here and they can also attend these events. What we critique about this quote was that, you know, these uh, students, and Fei Fei is not the only student, many of them seem to have this oblivion about the, the class uh, makeup of the British society. It, you know, they sort of assume that because they had this proximity, they would, would necessarily be able to attend these events, uh, uh, not knowing or uh, uh, not, not paying attention to the fact that maybe uh, these events require, you know, economic uh, resources, require uh, time resources, you know, you need to be free to attend these events. And you also need to have the cultural capital to able to uh, appreciate and also to make good use of these events to, to sort of uh, increase your global uh, cultural taste. And therefore what we found or, or argued in, in these, uh, 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 so the paper is that what remained constant was the exclusivity of such an assortment of cultural events, which were made available through their transnational education mobility, thanks to their middle class cultural taste and economic capital. And therefore, in the course of distinguishing themselves uh, through such a, a set of acquired and displayed global cultural taste, these Chinese women students inadvertently underlined the, import, the central importance indeed of their middle class privileges, which uh, enable them to savor a, a global cultural feast while they were studying in the UK. Now, um, the third data set that I'm drawing upon was this study that we uh, 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 carried out uh, in, uh, during the middle of the pandemic in 2020. So in this study, we observed that you know, institutions that previously in the pre-COVID uh, era made up very important uh, uh, sort of infrastructures that facilitated transnational migration and mobility became paralyzed. And these institutions include universities, border authorities, international transport and commercial agents like airports, airlines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They their functions were paralyzed because of the uh, largely state-centered approaches adopted by different countries in tackling the pandemic, you know, a travel ban, border control, vaccine tickets, et cetera, et cetera. All of these dis disruption uh, entail that, you know, state actors retreated from a transnational social space. And therefore, uh, the sort of coordination that were previously available between distinct institutions that brought the process of migration infrastructure into life was disrupted. And it was 
um, amid this kind of context that we argue that you know these transnational Chinese families sort of step step up uh, or step in to sort of uh, mitigate and to ensure that these Chinese students' uh, transnational mobility was facilitated. And here I would in particular want to draw upon the case of Kashian and her parents. I would like to evoke two quotes, especially from them, to showcase how they uh, managed to uh, ensure Kashian's safe return home during the middle of the pandemic in uh, 2020. So here uh, in the first quote, you can see uh, that the first change took place uh, uh, after her connecting flight was cancelled. She was studying in Edinburgh at that time. She said that change forced her to switch to a different date. And in order to do that, she had to call her parents because her parents bought the tickets for her and they could they had to provide information about the purchase. And then one day at 6 p.m., which was 2 to 3 a.m. in China, she learned that the first leg of her flight from Edinburgh was cancelled. So her parents stayed up with her, made all sorts of phone calls until about 4 a.m., which was 9 p.m. in the UK. In the end, they figured out a solution to have booked an alternative first leg from Manchester. Still, you know, from Edinburgh to Manchester, it was quite a distance, but they managed. Now, uh, at Edinburgh Airport, she said after she had uh, passed the security check, she, found, she was informed that her onward flight from Amsterdam was cancelled, although her ticket had already been issued. In shock, she and her parents had to secure their own connecting flight. Soon after they managed to, to do so, they found out that the Netherlands was about to tighten its transit policy just five minutes before her scheduled landing in Amsterdam. This entailed another night staying up for Kashin's parents to coordinate with the two airlines involved, the Chinese embassy and the Amsterdam airport. Now, the F efforts eventually, thank thankfully, um, brought together the airlines, the airport and Dutch border authority to have granted an exception for Kashian to make her journey home. Um, in, in this very uh, sort of vivid uh, case, you can see that this transnational family's uh, capability of infrastructuring on the go appear to be stratified indeed by, by their command of cultural and social currency in a transnational context in a global pandemic. So here, Kashian's parents were very well seasoned global travelers themselves. They had the experience that equipped them to, to, be, to have the knowledge and the confidence uh, to plan Kashian's journey on the go. Now, another case in our study that we evoked was Mr. Zhen, who had, who had studied in the UK for four years for his PhD, and he was able to quickly uh, make this return decision with his goddaughter to gather information and to indeed, in his own words, pull some strings to have materialized his goddaughter's return. However, for some other families, you know, after several attempts to secure a flight ticket or to negotiate border clearance, some of the less educated or less internationally experienced parents had to give up. They just told their, parents, uh, their, their children to stay put in the UK because they could not navigate these very uh, of obfuscating uh, and very complex uh, sort of waters uh, of transnational uh, migration in, in the pandemic. And therefore, although our argument is that although Chinese students' international education mobility has often been considered as um, upper middle class privilege, the pandemic has given rise to further, much more nuanced distinctions between these relatively privileged families as stratified by uh, the recognition and convertibility of their resources in a transnational context. And here, therefore today, I hope that by evoking these three different data sets, I have managed to persuade you that, you know, middle class transnational families cognizance with few specific roles and their abundant access to economic, social and cultural capital have played a pivotal role in the context of um, uh, what, what it means to be educationally, to be educationally mobile in uh, a transnational uh, environment uh, uh, within a global pandemic. And uh, therefore, I, I argue that a class-based, a very nuanced class-based and temporally sensitive approach towards researching international student mobility is necessary. And uh, a lot more research attention should be paid in this area. And these are the three papers that I have uh, drawn upon in my presentation today. And if you're, if you're interested, uh, please uh, download them, or if you can't access them, please email me, and I'll be very glad to share the papers with you. So that, that's all for my presentation. Thank you very much.
Okay, all right. Thanks so much, Cora. Yeah, um, fantastic. Um, and yeah, I've got lots of questions for you. So um, yeah, so finally, um, so uh, keeping with the uh, COVID themes, so these, these all kind of link together quite nicely. Um, so uh, we've got Catherine Gomez, so whenever you're ready, Catherine. Oh, hi everyone. Thank you, um, Ben. I'll, I'll share my screen and um, oops. What have I done? Mind you, I'm in the School of Media and Communication. You think that I'm, I should be better at slides. <laughs> oh, first of all, thank you so much, Ben, for inviting us. And thank you, Cora and, and, and Lee for such exciting uh, presentations based on you know your your body of research. And it's always very exciting for um, for any of us to actually meet each other, even online, um, to hear what we've been doing. And you know, even though we can't travel anywhere, well, literally can't travel outside borders, uh, international borders. You know, it's fantastic that we still can actually talk to each other. Um, you know, Cora in the UK. Um, um, ben in Hong Kong, so many of you everywhere else, you know, uh, and Lee sort of like few, few so far <laughs> neighborhoods away from me. So thank you so much everyone for coming. Um, and thank you for allowing me to talk about my work. Today I'm going to basically um, talk about um, my new book, <laughs> which is on um, kind of like covered by all our faces. It's uh, uh, on the side there, it's called Parallel Societies of International Students. And it's basically been based on um, the last decade of work we've been doing, literally. Um, I'll give you a little bit of uh, idea of where I'm coming from. Uh, my PhD actually was never in education. Uh, um, and it's, ne it's never been in, in uh, international education or international students. And yeah, I'm also not in this, any school of education. Um, I'm actually in the School of Media and Communication. My PhD was on, um, and this links to a little bit of what um, Cora was talking about. My PhD was on Chinese cinema. And so, um the link between well there's actually well clearly no link between what I do now and and my PhD but you know back in the day, the day when I was an undergraduate I was also an international student uh in Australia in Western Australia and I did a PhD sorry I did my undergraduate where um at that time I was also an international student activist and for some or other year when when you've got that in your blood it doesn't look quite um, leaves you. But I like to think that because I come from such a different background, uh, um, disciplinary background, um, that I, you know, I see things from different kinds, kinds of perspectives. And you know, today's talk really is quite different to, you know, the, the amazing work that Cora and Lee have been doing. And it does feed into this, these ideas of decision making, but it's from you know, different kinds of perspectives. Now, why well, I said, you know, this is my presentation today is based on the last 10 years of work. Um, and as you can see in my slide, it's been based on a lot of empirical research, a lot of interviews and a lot of focus groups and a lot of surveys. I wanted to point out actually the last survey, um, the one at the bottom that says that we surveyed 6,699 uh, uh, international students. And that was, was really quite interesting because that's one of the biggest you know, non-commercial, non-university based surveys that we did. And I did that with my long-term research partner at Melbourne University, uh, Shenton Chang, who you know many of you might actually know. Um, so Shenton and I have been working a lot together in terms of the digital experiences of international students. Uh, and right now we are co-editing uh, a um, special issue for journal of studies in international education on digitalization and international education. So you know, you know, again, sort of like shooting focus, but still with the digital uh, in, in um, being quite an important factor. Now this survey is interesting. And this is where like you, we start to think about decision-making uh, processes and trust uh, that international students have. Because when we did that survey, I actually burst out in tears uh, when we were getting the uh, um, uh, hits from it because uh, what basically happened was that within a day, we had 6,000 people answering that survey. So every time I checked, you know, throughout the day, it, it went up by a thousand, a thousand. And I panicked. I called my partner who's in IT 
uh, cries, you know, thinking that someone hacked into it. And I called Shenton, who was in Taiwan at the moment, at the time giving a presentation, you know, in tears. And he was like, just don't panic. And what we really, what we found out really was that we actually sent that survey to one of the um, um, health providers, uh, insurance health providers for international students. And the students actually, you know, um, answered that survey because of the trust that they had for their um, health provider. And that was really quite interesting because this is where we actually start to understand the decision-making processes of international students as well, where you, um, if there is an organization or a person that they trust, you know, they would uh, do something if they're being asked. So that was, you know, of course the survey then became a little bit too heavily uh, <laughs> Uh, health related, <laughs> but that for us was a really interesting and unexpected finding that we actually found. All right, so what are international student parallel societies? And this is what my book is about. And this is something that you know, um, uh, I've seen in the last 10 years of, of uh, the work that I've been doing. So why I basically been, why I argue in the book is that international students form parallel societies, which uh they occupy you know, where they do where these parallel societies do you know, do very, very much things that you know, um uh, Australian students and the wider Australian community does but you know these societies don't actually intersect yeah and I find that really quite interesting so I'll give you an example like you know a lot of international students I interviewed for for this particular book tell me things like oh you know it's really quite exciting we love going to the pub we love going for for um for uh for coffee in cafes we love australian culture but the thing is that you know, the performance of australian culture is very much within those parallel societies yeah you know and there's no sort of like integration with australian people and that is really quite interesting um and at the same time and when i say australian people even things like you know, cultural and ethnic similarities don't actually Connect. So international students will tell me things like, um, you know, um, uh, they find familiarity and similarity with each other because they are transient migrants. They don't find similarities and commonalities with people who are of similar cultural backgrounds to them who were born in Australia or who have lived here for a very long time. You know, so, you know, um, I interviewed someone from India and he was telling me, you know, Kat, um, I, you know, I don't identify with Indian Australians because, you know, they may look like me and they may sound like me, but they're not like me because they are more Australian than they are Indian. I don't see, you know, similarities um, with them. So even ethnic cultural similarities don't create these connect, you know, connections. But, you know, parallel societies are important. The similarities of, you know, of experiences is important. It's important because primarily because it allows international students to create this instant community, especially when they first come. Uh, when I interview students, they tell me that you know, the best friends that they, they made throughout uh, their time in Australia, uh, and even when I interviewed people similarly in Singapore, were the people that they first met. Yeah, you know, so like in Australia, for example, uh, we have uh, a welcome desk at the airport, or we used to have a welcome desk at the airport where international students volunteer uh, to welcome new international students. And so, you know, what then happens is that they make friends instantly. Um, and these friends last throughout the entire time that they are uh, doing their studies. Yeah, you know, and, and people tell me that, you know, the reason is because, you know, or, you know international students who have been here uh, become a really good source of information, trusted information for new international students. So what they end up doing is, you know, I remember sort of like um, uh, interviewing people where they tell me things like, and I put this in the slide, you know, only in other international students know how to open a bank account. Only other international students know where to get cheap Asian groceries if you're talking about Asian international students. So, there is that also sense of belonging, you know, connectivity, you know, um, and because, you know, international students are very fluid, you know, they are transient, they are temporary, you know, that becomes an, a very keen identifying factor 
that allows them to connect with each other. So it, you know, parallel societies do matter. When, whenever I, I write anything publicly, like in the conversation about international students, you know, I get really ready for like you, uh, so what you people to say things like, uh, comment in the comments, um, part about oh, but international students always stick together. But there's a reason for that, you know, it's about that sense of community, it's about that sense of trustedness, you know, it's and it's easier to make friends with people who are similar to you than it is to make friends with people who are different. I interviewed one person and they told me that, you know, they felt that, you know, Australians don't want to make friends with them primarily because they feel that it's going to be, um, you know, it, it is going to be a situation where uh, investing time and effort, then sort of like you will go to naught because that person will leave eventually. So it's sort of like really quite interesting. But the parallel societies, like I say, you know, con you know creates this connection. I wrote a book a, a couple of years ago called Silo Diversity, and there I explain about you know parallel societies, you know, and how they are meaningful to international students. But at the same time, it also leads to you. Know, echo chambers. And so what we actually been finding, and, and this is something you know, very much so, you know, even prior to COVID, where international students, you know, will listen to other international students. And so when we did that, you know, that almost 7,000 um, uh, person survey that I mentioned earlier on, we basically found that friendships made such a difference. So international students who were friends were only, you know, co-nationals, you know, who were also other international students, clearly. Um, were living in this echo chamber where they were repeating the same um, uh, types of information to each other. But then if they branched out to have friendship groups you know, with other international students who are from different countries, then you know, the, the information that they had about even Australia actually grew. And of, course, I, of course, ideally, will be having friends with, um, stu with students in particular who are Australian. You know, so, and that sort of like really was quite interesting. And, you know, if we look at COVID, COVID may be really quite fascinating because with COVID, international students uh, have actually been looking at Australian sources prior to, you know, to, to basically, you know, do things like find out whether or not um, their particular uh, neighbourhood you know, is a tier one uh, um, COVID exposure site. Prior to, um, to COVID, you know, when I interview people about, you know, who they ask for information, do they even watch, you know, uh, media in Australia? And they always tell me no, you know, in part because, you know, international students get their information from other people. And so some, uh, or other international students. Um, and so what happens is that, again, that echo chamber, but COVID has actually changed that. What I'll be fascinated to know is whether or not after COVID is over, you know, lockdowns are over, will um, students then continue um, engaging with you know, greater sources of information, especially in uh, the host country. All right, so why do you know, why do you know, international students come to Australia? I had fun doing this uh, animation yesterday. Uh, <laughs> these are images basically from, uh, oops, my cat's running around. These are images from um, Study Australia and Journal, which is a uh, accommodation provider. And if you look at all these you know, images, what do you see? You see um, images of people mixing around, pick people clearly from different cultural groups, right? Different ethnicities. You know, and so what basically then happens is that you know, the, the way that we you know, advertise is that we're selling a bit of a dream, right? You know, the dream of you come to Australia, you make so many friends, you know, you have a wonderful time, you're know, going to the seaside, having coffee with people, you know, you, you will form this immediate community that bridges, you know, uh, ethnic, cultural, even language divides. However, the reality is something else. This is you know, the, this little image I have here, and I write this in my book as well. Uh, it's from a um, um, online. Uh, it's from the Age, which is um, 
one of the you know, main uh, news um, papers in Australia, or at, at least in Melbourne. And this, base, this basically was a forum letter written by a celebrity, believe it or not, in Australia. And she was doing her master's in uh, one of the universities. And as you can tell from the title alone, what she was basically doing was that she wrote this letter complaining about how uh, she was spending all her time in class helping her group mates who were primarily uh, Chinese international students. And she goes on in the entire um, um, forum letter to complain about how she was wasting her time um, trying to explain things in English uh, to them. And what she based here, you know, she, she justified herself by saying that you know, she was a committed multiculturalist and all that, but, you know, is that, you know, that but bit. And what was interesting was that you know, there were over 700 comments from readers uh, who complained about how there were too many international students and how they were bringing down standards. They can't speak English. And this is something that comes up com you know, continuously. Where and, and this is where even for myself, whenever I write a public forum uh, opinion um, uh, um, essay uh, in any news website, I get ready for the backlash where people complain about you know international students being PR hunters, bringing down standards, you know, taking away jobs, you know, you know the drill, right? So and this sort of like becomes that reality bias, and it's so you know, and for so many reasons, it's so clear why international students then find that parallel societies create that sense of community, create also a protection. So when you know, um, when uh, COVID broke out, you know, there were quite a few media reports about xenophobia, especially in Australia. And so I'm doing a, a another sort of like, you know, small little research um, project on the side where I've been interviewing international students to reflect on, you know, their, their COVID lives in the last couple of years. And so all of them tell me things like, oh, you know, my parents tell me to be very, very careful when I'm in, you know, not to go out at night because of all the xenophobia and you know, and you see that also on on social media about being careful you know whether or not there's a you know, reality of you know uh, a lot of xenophobia on on the streets to be honest i'm actually not quite uh, i don't actually know but what i do know is that there is this fear you know that if you go out at night you are going to be beaten up because of the way that you look because of you know this response that people have um, this response that people have in terms of the stereotypes they have of international students, especially during during COVID, so that there is this reality bites of this fear, and so the only people who can you can you can you can trust will be other international students, you know. So you know it's so far, uh, it you know uh, that whole idea of sticking together of community you know, becomes very very real. So what about more about COVID? You know, lock, you know, what happens with lockdowns, you know, closed borders, you know, and all the challenges that international ha students have because of that. Um, I did a, 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 a short research project where um, my colleagues and I interviewed about 29 um, students, uh, um, higher degree by research students or so PhD students. And we did that where we interviewed both international students as well as domestic students. And what we were trying to find is, you know, we want, wanted to understand about their sense of belonging. Uh, we wanted to understand what they were going through. And what we basically found was also start differences, similarities and differences between uh, domestic students and international students. You know, both domestic students and international students had this fear, fear about what's going to happen after this, uh, fear about their futures. But for international students, it became even more um, more pertinent because so many international students worrying about family back home. Um, I interviewed um, a PhD student from um, South Asia and he was going to be a first time father. His wife was with him and then uh, borders started closing and he, he sent his wife back and she, you know, she was pregnant. And you know, he was not there for the birth of his first child. And so he was constantly worrying and he was in his you know, final year of his PhD as well. So with international students, there's this added, you know, um, added burden of worrying what's going to happen, you know, or what's happening, especially during a global pandemic to families back home. 
there's a term that so far I've been developing the last few months, you know, based on your current, um, my current interviews with international students dealing with COVID, right, with, especially with lockdowns. And it's it's a term that I kind of like borrowed in a way from uh, Sia, uh, uh, um, Sia Piao. You know, he, he create, created this term called shock mobility, right? Uh, which many of you have heard in the past year and where he was talking about you know how people had to quickly move you know when uh when uh, borders started closing i kind of like adopted that and, and created this whole idea about shock temporality where this idea of you know, all of a sudden you your sense of being temporary especially for international students is not extended you know so when i interviewed people they were talking about how you know, um, they thought that that by now, you know, they would have graduated, you know, I, uh, interviewing uh, postgraduate students and new, newly graduated PhD students who were talking about how they want, you know, they thought that um, by now they would be applying for postdocs in other countries. But, you know, they were stuck in this position where they were stuck at home, you know, they were stuck in this position where they didn't know what their futures were going to be because of something which they had no control over. And that sort of like created a situation where, um, you know, they weren't sure about their also their own personal futures as well. So it was really sort of like quite interesting. I think it's this young man who just graduated with a PhD and he was telling me that he wanted to apply for postdocs uh, outside of Australia. He's an international student as well. Um, and he had this fear that if he got that position, uh, he would never be able to be allowed back into Australia because he didn't know what was going to happen with COVID. And I think that is the thing about COVID, right? We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We literally don't know. You know, we might have, you know, in Melbourne, you know, Melbourne, we're having about 1,300 cases a day. Tomorrow, it might be 10,000 cases. And that might lead to snap lockdowns again. Uh, so we don't know what's going on. So this is sort of like something that we've never faced before. The last time the world experienced a pandemic was 100 years ago. 100 years ago, you didn't have so many international students, right? <laughs> so this is the first time and we are you know, in a situation where we're trying to figure out what we are doing. And this is where I think the pandemic is really making us rethink and reframe what is that international student uh, experience? You know, I think, you know, and, and to end you know, my, my, my short presentation today, I think we start, need to now think about you know, the established theories you know, that we've been using for, for decades, you know, you know, because we need to now reshape our lens, that we, the lens that we use in order to understand the international student experience. We need to also keep you know, an open mind about the, un, the evolving uncertainties that are developing around COVID, you know. Um, uh, but I say I, I love uh, um, Pia Xiang's you know, idea of that shock mobility, but at the same time, it's also shock immobility, right? And also, I think we need to rethink what is the international student? Who is the international student? You know, we, you know, and so many of us who are teaching have been teaching students remotely, you know, students who are meant to be international students, but they are actually not in the countries that we are teaching in. They are back home or, or in a third country. You know, so are they really international students here? And we have to rethink also your know, ideas about internationalization at home. How are even domestic students uh, coping with the fact that without international students you know, face to face, then that internationalization at home experience is also uh, in doubt. So it's really sort of like really quite interesting. Where I, I, you know, I, I think that we are in such a fascinating and interesting space in terms of rethinking things um, and re-looking at the way that we also conduct our research. So I think I might end now <laughs> and a little bit of um, uh, self-promotion, <laughs> just like Cora as well, because we, you know, again, thank you for, for giving us the space. So these are sort of like some of the things that I've written the last few years. And, you know, um, if you can't find it in your libraries, I'm happy to quietly <laughs> send you um, stuff if you email me. So thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to talk to you. And I'll okay. stop sharing. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, again, yeah, brilliant. And yeah, no problems with self-promotion. That's kind of like what we're here for, right? So um, 
Yeah, so now uh, plenty of time for questions. So, so we've got 45 minutes. Um, so we've got a few already in the chat. 